and I'm going to present some of my research and I really would like you, you to give me comments and criticism because this is very much research in progress and I'm really keen to know what you think about uh, it. Switch it on. Oh, it's not on. Where do I switch it on? Oh, here, I switch it on. Is it no. on? Oh. Yeah. Well, <laughs> now it's on. Uh, okay, uh, okay. So let me start by shortly introducing a new project of mine that I've started just this September. Oh, uh, wait. Oh. Ah, this way, yes. Okay. Hmm. Interesting. Okay, uh, the project is called Innovating Knowledge. In, it's a three year postdoctoral post project which is funded by the Dutch Organization for Scientific Research and it's carried out uh, at the Hauken Institute, which is one of the institutes of the Dutch Academy of Arts and Sciences. I started just this September, it will be running until April 2021 roughly, and its main objective is to study the manuscript transmission of the etymologia in Carolingian environment. As you probably know, Gustav Anschbach has counted more than 300 early medieval witnesses of the etymologia, of which the majority are Carolingian. The impressive manuscript tradition led Walter Potzig to proclaim that every Carolingian intellectual center possessed a copy of Isdor's encyclopedia, a statement which, even if it's a hyperbole, rings true as to the tenor of the Carolingian age. They really loved Isidore. The large number of surviving manuscripts from the Carolingian period proved a hindrance to the study of the Carolingian reception of the etymology. Today, some of the most pressing obstacles to a large-scale study have been, however, removed. Massive progress in manuscript digitization means that many Carolingian copies of the etymology are available online. The publication of Bishop's catalog means we no longer have to rely solely on Anschbach's handlings of manuscripts. New technologies make it possible for the first time to reunite these first fragments, and we should see the finalization of the new, uh, of the editorial series of the etymology next year, is the one in Belle Lettres. And I hope my project will benefit from all these developments. Now, it, it will not come as a surprise to you, perhaps, that um, many of the manuscript of these Carolingian manuscripts show traces of extensive engagement with Isidore's text. It is even possible to talk of Carolingian etymology, by which I mean a set of text versions of the encyclopedia that reflect appropriation of this seventh century text in Carolingian environment and updating to suit new needs and new interests. Words, sections, chapters, uh, even entire books could be added or removed. The order of the section shuffled, passages rewritten, and some of the books or book parts circulated separately as secondary works of Isidore. Carolingian engagement with Isidore could have also taken other forms. Some of the books received glosses. The layout and format of the encyclopedia were altered. It may have been equipped with new tables of contents and diagrams or other paratextual features. All of these means of appropriation deserve to be called innovations, a term I will use henceforth to talk about those textual elements found in early medieval manuscripts of the etymology that are secondary to the original text and at the same time are meaningful, reflect meaningful engagement with the text. So not errors, not some variant readings. We were talking about like larger size chunks of changes where you can say, okay, somebody had some sort of interest behind it. Why would they otherwise put a whole new chapter here? Uh, the etymology were naturally a dynamic text from the outset. They were open to updating and rewriting since early on, in fact, from the days of Braulio of Zaragoza, who was the first in the long line of innovators of Isidore's encyclopedia. Yet, due to the survival rate of Carolingian manuscripts, and since we can today localize many of them precisely and therefore use them as mirrors for specific textual communities, once we enter the Carolingian period, it is possible to study not only individual innovations, but to examine how innovations were shared, and therefore how innovations may have spread in the ecosystem of Carolingian scriptoria, monastic and cathedral schools, intellectual circles, and scholarly workshops. This is indeed the objective with which I have embarked on this project, believing that studying many different innovations and the dynamics of their spreading across the manuscript landscape can allow us to trace the contours of Carolingian intellectual networks. You can rightly ask how much of such an enormous task can be achieved when I'm actually, my project is only for one person, only for me, limited funding and three years only. And I can tell you already that I know that I have to narrow my focus and I will be looking specifically on book one of the etymology, which contains most uh, promising material. I intend to specifically examine the separate transmission of the first book and its parts in the context of the Carolingian study of grammar, and I hope to provide, uh, produce a digital edition of the glosses to the first book. Uh, and these are two of the case studies I'm uh, planning. And another case study or another sub-project is to trace and study Carolingian redactions of the etymology, of which traces survive both in textual tradition and manuscript evidence. And in fact, I wish to discuss one body of evidence for Carolingian editorial activity uh, today. 
And this is a material I have been working on since February this year, but I'm still not done. It's still work in progress, and that has to do with the amount of evidence. We'll see how much material there is. Um, so let me start from the beginning. January 2014, I visited the city library of Schaffhausen in Switzerland to examine a manuscript of the etymology held there, Schaffhausen min 42. While examining the manuscript, I have noticed something peculiar. Its text was equipped with critical signs. So this is how it looks, so you believe, believe me, they are inserted in the text. Uh, if, if you know anything about the science, they go back to Origen, who pr produced the first critical scholarly introduction of the Old Testament, the hexapla. Um, shortly, it was divided into six columns, and the hexapla allowed one to compare different text versions of the Old Testament, especially the discrepancies between the Septuagint and other Greek translations. Origin devised a system of symbols that marked omissions of one version against the others, working not unlike modern critical editors. Indeed, the hexapla can be seen as a late antique critical edition with the science taking the role of an apparatus criticus. Origen's pioneering philological method was popularized in the West by Jerome, who adopted it for his translation of the Old Testament from Greek, especially for his Psalter. Uh, however, it was Carolingian scholars who advanced the method further, realizing that if it can be deployed in, on Old Testament, it can be used for comparison of any text that existed in multiple distinct versions. In the Carolingian period, we thus see that Origen's method began to be employed on works other than the scriptures, specifically on texts central to the Carolingian Renovatio. A notable example um, uh, is the critical version of the rule of St. Benedict preserved in St. Gallen 914. Uh, the manuscript, as can be seen on the screen, I hope you see, and if you don't, here's a detail, contains origin and critical signs similar to those in Schaffhausen 42. I hope you see them, uh, and you see how they work and how they look. Um, but if not, here is one, for example, this prey is marked by critical signs. Here is another one here and one more here. Um, signs also mark variant readings in the margin, here reflecting the differences between the Frankish textual family and the Monte Cassino normal exemplar of the rule. As the prefatory letter attached to the manuscript attests, the critical version was produced around 816 by two Reichenau monks, Tato and Grimaud, on the request of Regenbert, the famously learned bibliothecarius of Reichenau. All of these three characters are well-known Carolingian masters and literati. Indeed, origin and critical signs belong to the repertoire of those who attain the highest degree of learning. Their presence in manuscripts is almost universally a clue to Carolingian scholarly projects, a vestige of activity of those who may be termed scholars of imperial rank. I hope it is clear why the critical signs in Schaffhausen 42 came as an extremely exciting discovery. They show that Isdor's etymology was a subject of focused scholarly interest in the Carolingian period, not unlike the rule of Benedict, the Bible, and other key texts of Carolingian reform, reforms. Uh, since the manuscript was produced in the second quarter of the ninth century at Mainz, according to Bernhard Bischoff, the person who comes to mind is, of course, Rabanus Maurus. He can be very much, he is very much a scholar of imperial rank, um, and he certainly did, did have the scholarly acumen to, to carry out this sort of philological work. More importantly, his interest in the text of the etymology is well documented, nonetheless, at least as he produced a reworking of Isdor's encyclopedia, his De Universo. However, this hypothesis proved unsubstantiated once it became clear that Schaffhausen 42 is not the only Carolingian manuscript of the etymology containing critical signs. Since 2014, four more critically annotated manuscripts came to light. And these are Sangalen 236, which contains the second decade of the etymology. And I should mention here, Schaffhausen 42 contains the first decade, so books one to 10, so, and Sangalen 236, book 11 to 20. So the second half, then there is Zofingen PA32, which contains the entire etymology, and then there is a two-volume copy of the etymology, Sangalan 231 and Sangalan 232. And so that you believe me, uh, here are examples of those critical signs inside these, from these manuscripts. So this is how they look. So. Unlike the Schaffhausen manuscript, which was a mobile book, and we don't know where it was in the early Middle Ages, it was produced at Mainz, but obviously it was somewhere else. Schaffhausen itself was not founded until 11th century, so it was somewhere in between, we don't know where. Uh, these four manuscripts were static books. 
They were produced at Sangamant in the second half of the ninth century. They were present in Abbey's library throughout the Middle Ages, and three of them are kept there today. The Zofingen manuscript is in Zofingen only from the, I believe, 18th century. So it's, or, it was originally in Sangamant until 18th century. Thus, it is evident that the presence of critical science in the five manuscripts has to do with Sangalan. And these signs reveal a collation project involving these five manuscripts that took place at the Abbey in the Carolingian period. Now, the critical signs are something very, something very uh, uh, grabs your attention. That's something very unusual. So that's what kind of highlights the, uh, the, the collation pro project. But they are not, neither the only nor the most informative element of what I term the Sangawan collation project. Upon closer examination, the five manuscripts reveal traces of a complex but coherent scribal workflow that includes marking of transposition. Uh, inclusion of passages missing in the text, and most importantly, the addition of variant readings in the margins uh, and using um, the, the marginalium aliter or alibi, A-L or A-L-B. And this is consistent in all of these manuscripts. Um, it, it is these variant readings that allow to date the project to the second half of the ninth century, or at best to the beginning of the 10th century. That is to the golden age of the Carolingian St. Gallen during the, the abbacies of the three great abbots, Grimald, Hartmut, and Solomon. The passages equipped with critical science and variant readings in the five identified manuscripts can be cross-examined to show how the scholars behind the collation project worked and why we should talk of an ambitious scholarly undertaking. And here is where I would like uh, to ask you to look at the handout. We will be looking at the handout now for a while. So first and foremost, you should know that we're, we're talking about five manuscripts, and when you put them together, you realize they, they co complete three complete series of the etymologia. So should, we should distinguish manuscripts and the series of etymologia. Uh, I will call them series A, B, and C. So the Schaffhausen manuscript and the Sangalan Sangal 236 actually seem to go together. They have been annotated across, and they are the first series, a complete series of the etymologia. Then uh, the Zofingen manuscript is itself complete, so that's a complete series, series B, all 20 books. And then the Sangalan 231 and Sangalan 232, that's a third series, the, I will call it the series C. And in your handout, under the, the overview of the manuscripts, you, you see how the signs look based on the individual manuscripts. So you see, uh, you have examples for you, uh, even but you don't, don't see them on the screen. Now, uh, you should know we're talking, so far I have identified over 100 passages marked by critical signs. They do not appear in the manuscript um, consistently. Some books are annotated more thoroughly than others. Some books do never receive any critical signs. So for example, book 11 is not annotated in this way at all. And uh, there, about one third is in the first 10 books, and two th third of the signs appear in the second 10 books, which is quite interesting as well. And there are so about more than 100 passages with critical signs, plus there are variant readings. There are more variant readings than critical signs. And that's, that means it's a bigger project to look at them and, and see how, how many there are. Uh, now, if you ask, the, the most important question you can ask, or the most, I think, question you, everybody has, what these signs show? Do they show collation of these manuscripts against each other? The simple answer, yes. This is what, exactly what the signs are doing, and this can be very nicely proved from when you look at certain passages. So if you look at section B of my handout, these are passages, several, just several. I just uh, um, look at some, took some examples, uh, three passages which show collation, which definitely shows that Schaffhausen manuscript was uh, collated against the Zofingen manuscript. I will also show you that, show this on the screen. Um, I, I chose the example number two, in, on, uh, so uh, that's book two, chapter 28, section four. Uh, no, sorry, sorry, bad. <laughs> book two, section 20, uh, book two, chapter 24, section two. <laughs> uh, and you see what's happening there, and I hope you can see it very well on, this, on the screen. It's about the shape of, uh, of moon. And one manuscript, the Schaffhausen manuscript, has convexa as a base reading. There are signs, uh, critical signs saying there is something wrong, or this is not, this is dubious, or there is some problem. And it has aliter, cava, meaning concava. If you look at the Zofingen manuscript, it has the opposite reading. So it has originally concava, and in the margin is aliter convexa. So this shows you that these two were collated, and the third manuscript, the series T, has only con concava and no, no, no variant reading or no, no signs. Um, so this is one example where you see this happening. Uh, you also can see uh, in the same way, at, I think that's section C, I believe, but you see that the collation also took place against the manuscript Sangalan 231 and Sangalan 232, so that's series C. 
and here is an example of that, I believe. Uh, here, this is also on your handout. This is the second example, so book one, chapter 35, section seven. Uh, the problem is with Hock Est, and you notice that the, um, the both Schaffhausen and Zofinger manuscript has Hock Est, and the only manuscript series that doesn't have it is the series C, and that's where the, the signs come from. That's probably where, what, they were, what they were collating against. Um, now, one of the main conclusions of this ongoing collation, and this is, this is it, I basically have this huge collation table and just going on and on and on and trying to see all the passages and see what, how it, what it tells you about how these people were working and what they were trying to achieve, is that um, even if you take uh, all the critical science and if you look at uh, these three series of manuscripts, um, that still there must have been more manuscripts involved in the collation as some of the critical signs and variant readings cannot be explained from these three manuscripts alone. And that's the example I, I provide in, uh, on your handout. It's section D, and I also have it here on the screen. Uh, so you can follow me wherever you like. Uh, these are the three manuscripts, uh, so series A, B, and C. You notice uh, this is book 12, chapter 1, section 52. The, the reading, base reading should be qui frontem album calidi. And you notice, I hope you see it on the screen, all three manuscript series have Kalidi as their base reading, so no problem there. But uh, um, two of them have signs, one of them has signs, definitely. So here is a sign underneath, that's, that's an obolus here. And all three of them have identical variant readings in the margin, which read Aliter Kaliti Vel Candidi. So there are two variant readings, so a collation against two other manuscripts. It's very clear from this that the variant readings cannot come from either of the three series. There must be at least two more manuscripts involved. Um, now, uh, as to the variant candidi, oh, actually, I want to point out one more thing. You notice something different uh, between the series. In series A and series C, the var both variant readings are included, uh, inserted by the same hand. That's the same handwriting and the same ink. But in series B, that's the Zofingen manuscript, there are two different ones. We'll get back to that later, what it could may or may not mean. But it's very interesting. It's, it may be that the, 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 the second variant reading came a bit later in the Zofingen manuscript. In, so what I started to do was looking for these variant readings. And as to the variant Candidi, that's a mystery. I haven't found a manuscript like that. It's not in the Apparatus Criticus of Lindsay, and that's not uh, unexpected. So it means I maybe will be lucky and I will find a manuscript with this reading, or more, more likely I will not be lucky and I will not find a manuscript. Um, but uh, with the, the variant Kaliti, we have better luck because Lindsay's apparatus criticus actually is helpful and contains this variant, and it will tell you this is the variant found in the famous Carolinus, that is manuscript Wolfgang Botto Weissenburg 64, which is the 8th century manuscript of uh, the etymology from Bobbio, and a very important witness of the Italian family. It is a very specific Italian reading. And indeed, this Italian reading can be found in two old incomplete copies of the etymology from St. Gallen which are Sangawan 233 3 and Sangawan 235. Um, and this, it's very likely that uh, then these variant, this particular case shows that uh, these were also included in the collation somehow. Yet while some of the Italian variant readings marked in the Sangawan manuscripts may come from either of the two codices, there are additional variant readings that cannot be explained from these two manuscripts. In the first place, both manuscripts are incomplete. Sangal and 233 contains only books 6 to 8 and 12 to 15, and Sangal and 235 only books 12 to 20. Yet we do have these Italian variants also for the other books. So it's very clear there was an, an, an Italian manuscript, which follows, by the way, you can, you can compare these variants against, against Carolinus, and you see again and again and again that Carolinus comes up as uh, the closest manuscript, and that's because it was a manuscript which looked a lot like Carolinus. Um, um, or maybe it was the manuscript itself, but I'm not going to talk about it. Um, uh, okay, so, uh, and this is, uh, yeah, you can also see this in the section so, so, so there is a problem because even collation against Sangoan 233 and Sangoan 235 does not explain all of the reading, as you see in the case of Candidi, but also in the case of other readings, and you have some of them in section E of the handout. Um, let me see what I have here. Oh, yes, uh, this is, I, can, I, will, I will skip this because I have a lot to say and I don't want to bother you too much. Uh, but here are some examples. This is one example uh, of a reading which looks like Carolinus. So it's a Carolinus-like manuscript. Uh, it cannot be explained from uh, A, B, and C. Uh, it's not found in uh, Sangoan 233, Sangoan 235. This, this is the case of word Candidus. It's book 10. That's just the word Candidus there. And no, just a lemma and no, exp uh, no, no interpretamentum. And this is a problem. And you notice that, again, A, B, C has them. Two of the manuscripts say uh, there is something fishy about it. And you would notice, hopefully, probably can read it 
it's missing here. So it looks like it was co uh, these manuscripts were collated against a manuscript that looked a bit like Carolibus. Um, and here I have example. So this is one of the examples, just one, where you see, where you can compare A, B, and C against Sangha 1, 2, 3, 3, and you, against Carolinus, and you still see that uh, the, the signs reflect collation against a manuscript that looks somehow different, so that yet another manuscript. Okay. Oops, sorry. Um, so let us now zoom out from the manuscripts to talk about the ramification of the manuscript evidence. In the first place, we are obviously talking about a scholarly enterprise that would tie in a large amount of time, resources, and manpower, an enterprise that moreover could be entrusted only to those most learned and therefore capable of carrying out the critical assessment. The collation project presupposes a central planning and skillful management, and therefore at least one mastermind of truly imperial rank. Furthermore, it also required an accumulation of manuscripts of the etymologia. It was a project on the scale, I think, comparable to the production of the pseudo Isdorian decretals, or what we see Flores of Leon and his workshop can be achieving. Yet the project of such a scale and sophistication escapes scholarly attention. Uh, why? The most obvious answer is that we do not possess written evidence that would refer to it. It can be contrasted in this regard with the critical version of the rule of bending we have seen earlier, a project which was smaller in scale, somehow compared but smaller, yet it is well known to the scholars since at least the 19th century because of the prefatory letter that situates this enterprise and connects it with known intellectuals. Nevertheless, there are ways how to notice that the etymology received an unusual degree of attention in Sakhalin, and we have actually already heard something about it. Uh, so I, can, I repeat, my, my list is way smaller than the list that was shown earlier. Um, we can notice that uh, if you look at surviving manuscripts tied to St. Uh, we gain the impression that St. possessed more manuscripts of the etymology than other Carolingian centers. By 900, the Abbey owned at least three complete sets of the encyclopedia, that's St. Gallen 231232, St. Gallen 237, and Zofingen 32. Then there are three more manuscripts representing incomplete copies, Sengalan 233, Sengalan 235, and Sengalan 236. Uh, and then there are several collections of incomplete uh, excerpts from the etymologia, and these are just some. There are more, there are fragments, and there's a very famous Irish fragment, which is very early. Plus, now we should say that Schaffhausen 42 was at Sengalan, and in fact, it seems that Sengalan 236 may have been produced, so, so to say, to complement uh, Schaffhausen 42, to provide the first, uh, sorry, the second decade, so that there's a, another full series, so at least four full series. And that's a lot for Carolingian centers. That's, uh, that's mo more than any other center I know it so far. Um, the collection of the codices of the etymology was not only large, but also diverse, as manuscripts representing probably all four major families of the etymology were present at St. Gallen in the Carolingian period. Indeed, the presence of these different text versions of the etymology may have been the stimulus for the collation project, as readers may have been alerted, if not alarmed, by the discrepancies between codices and therefore sought to, to cure dissonance of the manuscripts by deploying origins critical method on Isidore's encyclopedia. To be clear, neither the accumulation of diverse versions nor the collation indicates that Carolingian masters were aware of the existence of the families identified by Lindsay nor were they intent on producing a text that would follow the criteria of modern textual criticism. Rather, in Carolingian period, due to the productivity of the Carolingian scriptoria and the in increased connectivity between intellectual centers, it was possible for the first time since the seventh century to be in situation, and that's what seems, what, that's what seems to have happened at St. Gallen, that you could have many different copies and you were suddenly in a situation where you didn't know what was, what was good and what was not, and you could not resolve the differences between the manuscripts, and if, you couldn't do it by simply amending the codices, and you couldn't do, could not do it by simply adding an extra codex saying, let's borrow something from the neighbor and see what they have, it would just uh, throw you into more confusion. And the response uh, that we see in St. Gallen is actually very Carolingian. And uh, uh, the only thing that can be added here is that is the, the role of the Schaffhausen manuscript, uh, whether it, um, it, it, it um, reached St. Gallen from Mainz uh, by accident, it just drifted there, and it was utilized for, uh, utilized for collation because it was found already in the library, or whether it was procured for this purpose. This is also possible. Uh, and I should mention this, that the Schaffhausen manuscripts, so again, uh, not only are the signs not equally distributed among the books, but they are not also equally distributed among the codices. Most signs and most variant readings are found in the Schaffhausen manuscript. 
which is the manuscript around which everything seemed to be circled, like surrounded. So it may have been that actually these manuscripts started it all. They received this copy from Meisner, and they're like, ah, what do they have in mind? It's really weird. This is not how it should look. Um, now, there were quite a few illustrious scholars active at St. Gallen in the second half of the ninth century. They may have been involved in the collation project. These are schoolmasters Iso and Notker Babulus, the Irish master Marcellus, the chronicler Rutbeard, among others. Uh, and we don't know, and it's possible that one, two, more of them were involved, but it's not obvious in any way. There are, however, two names that can be attached to the enterprise, and those are, those are the names of the two abbots, Grimaud and Hartmut. Grimaud was one of the most important political figures of the Eastern Frankish Kingdom in the second half of the ninth century. He served as the Chancellor of Louis the German and as an abbot of both St. Gallen and Weissenburg from the 840s until his death in 872. Grimaud's involvement may explain how the Schaffhausen manuscript came to St. Gallen, as he was a pupil and a close friend of Rabanus Maurus. More importantly, our Grimaud is in all likelihood identical with the Grimaud mentioned by the preface of the critical version of the Rule of Benedict in St. Gallen 914. As can be pointed out, the workflow visible in St. Gallen 914 shows many similarities with the workflow observable in the St. Gallen manuscripts of the Etymologia. If you look at it clear, uh, closely, it's very much the same principle. The only difference is that the variant readings here in the uh, St. Gallen 914 are marked with these double dots the decolon, if you wish, um, but uh, and in, the, in, the, in the etymology, it's aliter or alibi. Um, uh, and the otherwise, it's the same thing, it's the same principle. It is certainly imaginable that Grimaud was the mastermind directing the application of the critical method he had learned as a youth in a more mature and more ambitious undertaking. Yet, Grimaud was probably not directly involved in the project as much as he may have initiated it. As a layabout, he was rarely present at his abbey, spending most of the time at the royal court. His absentees was so grave that the community petitioned the king to allow them to select a deputy who was tasked with running the abbey while Grimaud was gone. And this deputy was, oops, this deputy was Hartmut. In Casus Sancti Galli, Rutberg credits Hartmut not only with effective leadership, but with greatly expanding and refining the Abbey's library, in fact presenting it as Hartmut's most important achievement. During his time in office, first as Grimaud's deputy and then as his successor, Hartmut oversaw execution of several ambitious copying projects, such as the production of a six-volume set of Augustine's Generaciones, and had a number of colleges copied for his private library. Both Rutbert and the 9th century library catalogues of St. Gallen mention two sets of the etymologia as copied under Hartmut's direction. This is the one volume copy, which should be, uh, 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 there is an, uh, one volume copy mentioned, which should be identified with Zofingen 32. And there was a two volume copy, which has been securely identified as St. Gallen 231, 232. And moreover, Bruckner believed that St. Gallen 236, which is another manuscript included in the collation project, was also produced under Hartmut. And it therefore seems there are many good reasons to believe that the bulk of the collation was carried out during Hartmut's time in office. Now the last question I wish to consider is um, to what end and with what purpose were manuscripts of the etymology collated at St. Gallen? Are the critical signs and variant readings in the margin a trace of a preparatory work for a production of a critical text of the etymology similar to the text of the Rule of Benedict in St. Gallen 914? Indeed, we possess a scholarly redaction of the etymology that was produced at St. Gallen in Hartmut's time. A project I did not mention because I would have to talk about it for the next 45 minutes. It's really interesting um, and it's extremely important because it's very, like, why would they have two different projects at the same time? It just tells you how important St. Gallen was for Isidorean studies or how interested they were in, in Isidore at St. Gallen. Uh, in fact, we have today the archetype of this redaction and it happens to be uh, the manuscript we have already seen, Zofingen 32. Um, so one of the manuscripts that was involved in the collation project. Uh, I could go on, I would have to explain you how do we know that this is in the archetype, uh, why is this a new redaction, I don't want to go into details. Um, just want to say, believe me for now, okay. uh, or ask me about it in the, in the questions, I can tell you. So this is very interesting. We do have the collation project and we do have a redaction produced. Is there a link? Well, there's a problem with chronology because it, it does not allow this codex to be the desired end product of the collation. Not only was it one of the manuscripts that received critical signs suggesting that its production preceded the collation, 
But one of the series of the etymology employed in the collation, the series C, Sengoen 231, Sengoen 232, was produced perhaps a decade or two after the Zofingen manuscript, and thus its text and apparatus could not depend on it. And there is, this is a huge puzzle. I don't have the, the clear answer. One of the solutions may be to concede that the redaction represented by the Zofingen Codex and the collation projects were unrelated, even though it would mean that Hartmut and his scriptorium engaged in two rather than just one demanding scholarly enterprise, an extraordinary, although perhaps not an entirely unimaginable feat. And it may seem logical to us today that the two projects were interrelated, or even that one such as the collation led to the other, the redaction. However, we must concede that medieval logic may have been quite different from our course of action. This doesn't have to be that way. The placement of some of the critical signs and variant readings in the five identified manuscripts suggests that they were inserted over a prolonged period of time and may have never had, therefore, a final goal. And here is a very interesting example. This is a um, one of the leaves from the Zofingen manuscript. That's why I call it the, uh, the archetype. There's, there are lots of passages where the, the content is crossed out or erased. There are leaves which are torn out. It seems to be a work in progress. And this is one of the passages which in the end does not get into the archetype. It gets crossed out and it just stays there crossed out. And this is the same passage is copied somewhere else because it should be in different order. And notice here, I, I don't know whether you can see it very clearly, there is a passage marked with critical signs there. I hope you can see the signs uh, above the word significat on one side on the other side. So it seems the signs were there first and then the, the passage was crossed out, meaning only then they decided it will not be here, it will be somewhere else. Which suggests a, 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 the for, collation first, redaction later. Um, so there is a second and more likely possibility that the collation and the resulting insertion of critical signs and varied readings in the copies of the etymologia produced or procured in the second half of the ninth century by, by St. Gallen were a goal unto itself. The production of a better reduction of the etymologia may have been aligned with the collation as far as the latter would enrich the former over a period of time. Each successive copy made from this archetype transmitting more and more of the apparatus and more and more of the variant readings. And that this may have been the case is indicated of one of the, by one of the descendants of the Zofigen manuscript. Wolfenbüttel of Weissenburg II, which is an 11th century copy, um, not directly made from the Zofingen manuscript, there is probably one intermediary. So it is a Weissenburg copy, very clean, 11th century. It's very possible that the Zofingen manuscript, which was in St. Gallen, uh, they made a copy 9th century for Weissenburg, which was sort of the sister abbey, and then from this 9th century copy, they produced this 11th century manuscript. The reason why to think this is that there are variant readings in, the, in this 11th century manuscript. They appear in the same place and same position as the variant readings in the Zofingen manuscript. And you notice that in the, the Wolfenbüttel manuscript, in the, the Weissenburg copy, they're in the, by the main hand, so they're copied from the exemplar. But in the Zofingen, they are the second hand. They are, the, they are one of the people who are amending or who are collating. And they get inserted into the Weissenberg copy, but not all of them. So it seems that the moment when there was a copy made for Weissenberg, perhaps, the, the Zofingen copy has not yet been collated completely. Not all variant readings, were, as we find them now today, were there. And the copy was dispatched first, and then they continued maybe onwards. Um, so, and this is where I want to end my talk because I've been talking for probably too long already. Uh, I do not have any firm conclusions at, at, at this moment. As I said, this is a work in progress. What I still need to do, I have this collation table. I still continue adding more variant readings, more signs. I have to see the manuscripts again, so I need to go back to Switzerland, and that's the plan for the next year. And maybe I will be able to tell you something more about uh, the context, the purpose, how these people are working, what kind of errors they are making, who was behind this project, and what was the relations uh, to this redaction that was also produced around the same time by possibly the same people under the same abbot and at the same that does not seem to be very particularly connected with it. So thank you for your attention today. Thank you.